All right, so this week, mostly what we're going to be focusing on is kidneys and stuff associated with the kidneys. So you guys already had um, your asynchronous weeks. You had some kidney stuff that was related to the urinary test you guys were doing in uh, clean diagnostics. I was asked to include some stuff for there. This is like whatever is left over, okay? So uh, mainly talking about kidney function and how how urine is formed and how we get rid of it out of our body. So, this is a kidney. Wow. I know you guys couldn't have guessed that. Nice kidney. That's what she said. <laughs> um, <clears throat> what? Yes, I am. Are you asking because I just said that, or are you asking because? We don't want you to forget. Yeah, no, yeah. I'm the first. Jesus Christ, now you're making me all Sorry, you made you paranoid. Okay, yes, I'm recording. Okay. Don't ask again. All right, kidneys. Uh, this section right here, cortex. This section right here, medulla. All right, that's important for how the kidneys function because most of your filtering functions occur up here in the cortex, but a lot of the water handling occurs in the uh, medulla and what we're going to see is the medullary osmotic gradient. All right, if we look in closer, we have all of these little structures here called nephrons and nephrons are the functional units of the kidney. All right, their job <clears throat> and it's a complex structure uh, that will go through part by part is to filter blood and make urine. All right, and so to make urine, we have to filter blood. So that means if your patients aren't peeing, where's the problem probably? Kidneys, right, probably with the nephrons. All right. <clears throat> Talking about renal blood vessels, no, you don't have to know the entire pathway that I laid out here, but um, anatomically you start with the, but I'll go through it just for, uh, to kind of focus on the parts that are up here. The renal artery, then that branches off into segmental arteries, and then that branches off into lobar arteries, and then that branches off into interlobular arteries, arcuate arteries, so I'm down here, interlobular arteries, <clears throat> and then we go to the functional part, all right? The parts that we are concerned about are the afferent arterial, the glomerular capillaries, and the efferent arterial. <clears throat> Keep in mind that this afferent arterial is still part of our, our artery system. Capillaries, efferent arterial is still part of the arterial system. So we haven't gotten to a capillary where we're actually doing oxygen and carbon dioxide exchange and nutrient exchange. Once we get to the paratubular capillaries, then that's where we start having that kind of stuff occurring, like getting rid of things we don't want, keeping things that we do want. All right, fine, I'm shutting it off. <laughs> That's annoying. I'm just trying to give you guys the headache I have. All right, and then the veins are gonna follow the same path back out until you get to the renal vein going out this way. Anatomically speaking, what should come anterior, what should be posterior? Renal artery anterior renal vein posterior, all right? That has nothing to do with this class, but uh, it is important for anatomy. All this slide is doing is going through the same stuff, just kind of showing you what the blood flow really looks like. So here would be our afferent arterial, glomerular capillary, efferent arterial, highlighted here. That's where filtration and exchange are gonna occur. So we'll focus in more on that going through. Each one of our kidneys has about a million nephrons. So total, we have about two million nephrons. How much of a reserve capacity is that, do you think? Do you know? Like, how much of our kidneys can we get rid of and still function normal everyday life? We can live with one kidney. Okay. Can we live with less than that? 
We can live with one half of one kidney. One half of one kidney is how much reserve capacity we have, which is why it's not really a big deal to get rid of a kidney if, some, if you're donating it because you have a lot extra reserve capacity. All right. Um, in these nephrons, we have a renal corpuscle, which is this thing right here. Um, if you've learned other names for these things that are named after people, I tend not to use those. Um, so I think, I don't remember if there's something for the corpuscle, but the capsule is called Bowman's capsule. You won't hear me say that. It's the glomerular capsule. Um, so in the renal corpuscle, this thing, we have the capillaries as well as this capsule that's collecting fluid that's coming out of those capillaries, okay? So again, this is a site of filtration, not a site of exchange. All right, so the blood flow going into there, capillaries, fluid out, then the blood's gonna flow back out, okay? And that's gonna become part of these paratubular capillaries where a lot of that exchange is going to occur. And these are just uh, pictures at the bottom of what glomeruli look like under an electron microscope. To me, they look like little brains. Right, doesn't it look like that? Okay. Now, the fluid that comes out of these glomerular capillaries goes into this tubular network that I'm drawing in blue here. It's kind of relaxing, actually. <laughs> um, that's called the proximal convoluted tubule because it's proximal to where the filtration is occurring, okay, or where the blood is entering. Then we have the nephron loop, which is also known by the older generation as the loop of <laughs> Henley, okay. I dated a girl named Henley. That's probably why I don't like, never mind. <laughs> so it has a descending limb that has a very specific function has the ascending limb that also has a very specific function, and we'll talk about those. And then we enter into the distal convoluted tubule where a lot of your <clears throat> water exchange and uh, concentrated of urine will occur. Then everything that exits the distal convoluted tubule will end up in these collecting ducts. And these collecting ducts, let me see if I have the picture. These collecting ducts all go down into the medulla into the tips of these renal pyramids and the urine collects in the renal calyces and then it goes into the renal pelvis and then the ureter and then down to the bladder, okay? So um, each one of these branches would be from different nephrons going to collecting ducts. Two types of nephrons to be familiar with. The majority of them are these cortical nephrons, called so because they are located mostly in the cortex. Notice that their nephron loop doesn't dip very far into the uh, medulla. Primary function, filtering blood and helping to form urine. The other 20% are these things called juxtamedullary nephrons. And those juxtamedullary nephrons are um, right at the border between the cortex and the medulla. Notice they have a really long nephron loop. They're gonna be really important for regulating water balance. Okay, not only within the nephron loops themselves, but helping to maintain the concentration of fluids within the medulla. I actually really like the kidneys. Everybody hates the kidneys. I like the kidneys. I don't know why. All right, <clears throat> so what is urine? All right, urine, anything our body wants to get rid of, waste. Any excess water we take in, so if you guys are the type that drink like three gallons of water a day and you're going to the bathroom a lot, urine, we get rid of it through urine, and getting rid of uh, excess electrolytes, either excess electrolytes or electrolytes we don't want anymore, okay? And to form urine, we have three processes. First, we filter the blood, right, and that takes place in the glomerulus, then we go through process of reabsorption, okay? So the reabsorption is anything that was filtered by the glomerulus that the body says, hey, we want that back. So that goes back into the blood, into circulation, back throughout the rest of your body, 
okay? Tubular secretion is things that weren't filtered that our body says, hey, we want to get rid of these things, so let's actively try to kick them out. All right, so that's tubular secretion. So reabsorption is going from the tube Tube to the blood, that's reabsorption. Blood to the tube, that's secretion. <laughs> All right, and I'm generically using the term tube. So when we get to those points, we'll be talking about very specific tubes. All right, so um, despite one of the questions that you had on your exam, I want you to keep the process of secretion and excretion different for the kidneys. All right, secretion is anything that you're putting into the tubes. Now, just because you're putting it into the tubes, does that mean it's gonna stay there? No. All right, it could go be reabsorbed. But everything that goes out of the body is going to be referred to as excretion. All right, so when we're talking about secretion, we're talking about tubular process. When we're talking about excretion, we're talking about urination. All right, so what we get rid of in our body is whatever we filter by the glomerulus plus whatever our tubules secrete, so just putting things into the tubes, minus what the body takes back. All right? Minus what the body takes back. I will not ask you a question about how, this calculation, but this is uh, how those three um, processes work together. Don't quote me on this because I still have to check and your exam's far enough away. I don't think there's any math in the next exam. <laughs> All right, so let's start with glomerular filtration. Okay. Um, <clears throat> this is, I'm going to use board and I'm going to use a really generic uh, glomerulus here. That's our glomerulus, okay? And this is gonna be the capsule. All right, make sense? You guys agree? This is gonna be our afferent arterial, blood going in, remember afferent going towards, efferent is going away from the glomerulus, E for efferent going away, F this, I'm out of here, as one of my students put it previously. Um, e, F, F, get it? All right, then everything in between is this glomerulus and all the fluid that gets filtered from it goes into this capsule right here. Based on what you know already and any guesses, does that capsule fill up? Does this capsule, so here's a drainage port, like that's the proximal kind of the tubule, but does that capsule fill up? Yes, it does. And that's really important for a concept we're going to talk about later. So this thing is usually filled with fluid. And the glomerular capillaries are pushing fluid out as well. Okay, and then all that fluid gets drained into the PCT. All right, this being a capillary, it's very selective what it lets through. Okay, so it will let out water and anything dissolved in water, maybe some small proteins, but not usually. But blood, like red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets, and proteins remain behind. Okay, so everything dissolved, and then proteins re remain behind. Does all the fluid exit the capillary? No, it can't, because you have an efferent arterial where that blood is going to go to. So not all of it exits, um, but you get out the important stuff. All right, and then what ends up filling this capsule and going in the proximal column of the tubule is similar to plasma minus the proteins. So that's all it really is. Yeah, technically it would be like serum. Why didn't I think of that before? Damn it. <laughs> yeah, because it's not going to contain clotting proteins either. It's going to contain any proteins. So close to serum. serum. Because serum will stick. 
serum-ish. All right, <clears throat> so looking a little bit closer at the glomerulus, here's our afferent, here's our efferent, here's the uh, glomerular capillary bed. What do you notice significant about that glomerular capillary bed that's different than what you would see in a normal circulatory capillary bed? Fenestrations. What makes those? Okay, so good. Ooh, I almost drew with my marker on the... <sighs> That'd be bad. All right. First of all, the endothelial cells in your capillary have holes, big holes. Things get through. They're a lot more leaky than what you see elsewhere. Okay? Then they're surrounded by a basement membrane, and basement membranes typically like your collagen, extracellular proteins, glycoproteins, things like that. Uh, stuff can go readily through them, but it does have a filtering function as well. And then you have all of these little spiders around the capillary called podocytes. They're not really spiders or cells. Okay. Um, my son would have gone, really? In my body? He hates spiders. Uh, and what these do is they form like these tight, um, what, do, what do I call it? Coverings around the capillary that form slits. So what this, all of these together provide you with is a three layer deep level of filtration of the fluid coming out of the capillary, all right? So even though they're very leaky, they're also fairly selective on what they let through, okay? And generally, as we discussed, does protein enter the urine? Should you have protein in your urine? No. So if there is, uh, and these, this filtration membrane prevents that. So if you do have protein in your urine, where might it be coming from? Secretion? Good guess, but no. I, that's all I heard. So if you said something, I'm not addressing it. It's because I didn't hear you. Like the actual glomerulus that's coming apart. Epithelial? Okay, it could be coming apart. Could be epithelial tissue coming off the uh, capsule. I guess that's the photocytes that hold it on the capillaries, right? Do what? The photocytes that are on the capillaries that hold it. Possibly. But really, it's because you've destroyed your filtration membrane. Okay, if you destroy your filtration membrane, and what might destroy that? High blood pressure, High blood pressure renal tubular diseases, uh, yes. Those kind of things can destroy that. So that's the only way you're going to have proteins in your urine. You destroy that filtration membrane by any means. They just had, you guys don't get your renal pathophysiology until a year from today. So they just had their exam in that. Um, and they talked about renal tubular acidosis and stuff like that. And they're coming to me for questions. I'm like, I don't know. But what we do is we sit there and I work it out with them. And they're like, eh, okay. Sometimes they forget this. Sometimes it's a matter of it wasn't explained well. So if you guys have trouble in the future, you can come to me. I promise. I've actually taught pathophysiology for about 15 years. All right, a little bit about the glomerular blood vessels. All right, we've talked about the capillaries and the filtration slits and all that fun stuff. And, you know, we have a bunch of uh, serum-ish fluid exiting. But what about these guys here? Your afferent and efferent arterioles. I drew this up here very purposefully. Uh, one thing to note, one thing, okay, what do you notice about what I drew different between the afferent and efferent arterioles. Afferent's bigger. Afferent has a larger diameter. Okay. So what does that mean? There's probably not a pressure drop across the two. Because of the different size. So it's like constantly more fluid leaving. Good. A lot of blood going in. Little blood going out. That creates a high filtration pressure in your capillaries. Okay. So a lot of blood going in, a little blood going in. And this is normal condition. So this isn't so any, besides anything happening to these arterioles, 
uh, this is the normal condition because we want fluid going where? One direction. We don't want it backing up. What happens if it backs up? Bad shit happens. We'll just put it that way. All right. So, uh, good. Whatever comes off of this efferent arterial then goes and forms a capillary network surrounding the rest of the nephron, and that's where your exchange is going to pl take place. All right? So we had the filtration take place here with the glomerular capillaries, and all your secretion and reabsorption is going to occur within your peritubular capillaries. Okay? Okay. Are you guys too young to know South Park? No? Okay. Did I hear somebody say yeah? I heard a bunch of no's and I thought I heard yeah? Anyway, all right. Uh, filtrate. Is this? Yes. So, <clears throat> that brings us to the concept of filtration pressure, all right? In order to make sure that we filter the blood and it continues to flow in one direction out of the capillaries and into this tubule, we have to uh, maintain a certain pressure, outward pressure, all right? So that is a function of forces that favor filtration, in other words, everything that's pushing out, versus forces that oppose filtration. Because like any circulatory capillary, you're going to have forces pulling fluid back in, all right? So the main force involved in all of this is our hydrostatic pressure of the glomerulus. So blood's under high pressure, and blood under high pressure is going to put force on that wall. And what's it going to do? Force fluid out. Okay, kind of like, never mind. It would take too long to explain what it is, so it's not a good example. All right, but you're forcing out water and everything dissolved in it. What's left behind? Proteins. proteins. So we have proteins left behind. You also have cells left behind, but cells take no part in this next process. That protein acts like a sponge. And what do sponges do? They suck. All right, they suck fluid back in. So you got rid of a lot of fluid, but then you're left with like very little fluid plus sponges left. That's going to suck some fluid back in. Okay, that's what we call colloid osmotic pressure, pulling fluid back in. All right, and here's where the concept of this tube being filled with fluid is important. Because this tube is filled with fluid, it's going to exert a pressure on the outside wall of the capillary. All right, and that pressure on the outside of the wall is going to force some fluid back in as well. I don't care that you know the numbers, but if you take your uh, so we call that capsular hydrostatic pressure. If you take your glomerular hydrostatic pressure out and you subtract your plasma osmotic pressure and your capsular hydrostatic pressure, what you end up with is a positive net filtration pressure out. Okay, so no matter what's going on uh, with pulling fluid back in, the hydrostatic wins out in normal conditions. So, uh, do I do this now or do I do it later? Hmm. Okay, we'll do it later. GFR, that relates to GFR. All right, so now we know the floor forces involved now we have to talk about glomerular filtration rate. In other words, the rate at which these glomeruli are filtering fluid and the uh, rate at which you're filtering fluid is directly proportional to the glomerular filtration rate. So in other words, the higher the pressure pushing outward, the greater the filtration rate. Okay? Um, that's mentioned right here. All right. However, how can we increase G 
GFR? All right, first of all, do we directly increase GFR? No, we increase pressure, and that increases GFR. So if I ask how you increase GFR, I'm really asking how you increase pressure. pressure. All right, how do we increase the pressure? Pardon? That would increase pressure? Would it decrease volume where? No. What, uh, so what, it, what, remind me, what did I ask? How do you increase pressure? Okay, how do we increase pressure? If we, if we have less fluid in there, that's gonna decrease the pressure, right? Okay, so you already answered my second question. Drink, drink more water, yes. More fluid. Make the efferent smaller, more backflow, good. So you're getting ahead of where we wanna be. How else can we increase the pressure going out? More volume, more volume. We, we said that. What if we get rid of those negative forces? What if we get rid, what if we don't have as much protein in our blood? Will you have as much fluid going back in? No, so what's gonna to happen to your overall pressure? That's gonna go out, right? So all of those things that you just mentioned to decrease GFR are the opposite, right? Lower, lower fluid going in, more um, osmotic pressure, okay? <clears throat> Okay, so we're going to talk about some of those things, but really what I want you guys to get from here, uh, because we're going to talk about this right here, we can't really do much about this capsular, capsular hydrostatic pressure, but let's say we have liver disease. What would, that, what would that do to our blood, a liver disease, with regard to kidneys? Do, do what? So, uh, because there's less stuff being filtered out, therefore there is more solid juice or things present in the blood. No. Do what? Increase portal drainage. No. It would decrease total area osmotic pressure. Good. You have liver disease. Remember, all of your clot, mo or not all, all, most of your clotting proteins are made in the liver. Most of your plasma proteins are made in the liver. So, if you don't have a liver to produce these, your osmotic pressure goes down, um, that colloid osmotic pressure goes down, that automatically increases your filtration rate. Okay, so liver disease can indirectly increase um, filtration rate. Do we have more proteins or less proteins? What did I say? Liver disease, less proteins? Less. less proteins. So that's going to decrease osmotic pressure and more fluids going to go out, right? Did I say that? Yeah. Okay. You guys are confusing me. Stop. <laughs> I can't remember what I said 10 seconds ago, let alone a minute ago. Um, okay. Are we comfortable with that? I know we kind of went around in circles and I tried to do it by a Socratic method, but sometimes that fails. Mostly because my brain's all over the place. Do you guys like my PowerPoints in general? Yeah. Okay, I've, I kind of pride them on being highly organized. They are highly organized because I, I need them to be highly organized because I get off track. Um, so, GFR, <laughs> back to GFR. Okay, um, GFR is how we regulate um, basically how much fluid is being filtered by our kidneys. And statistics show we produce about 125 milliliters per minute, which is a lot if you think about it. That's all your glomeruli together. That's not just that one glomeruli that we showed in a previous picture. All of them together. Um, but almost 100% of that's reabsorbed. So you, throughout an entire day, can filter 180 liters of blood. 
but you only produce a liter of urine. All right? That's pretty efficient. So where does all that filter fluid go if it's not in the urine? It gets reabsorbed. Good. So that's one of the reasons why that reabsorption process is so, so important. Because if we got rid of that much water in a day, we might as well hook ourselves up to like a large bore IV the entire day. That's the only way we're going to survive. <clears throat> All right. Now getting to where you guys, uh, I, um, I almost called you Jamie, Jesse mentioned reg auto regulation of GFR. How do we control GFR in the face of everything else that's going on in the body? All right, so this process of auto regulation has to do let's use this, with our afferent and efferent arterioles. Okay, and the way this works, we're not going to, we're going to do some examples, but the way this works is that let's say we have hypertension. What does that mean for the amount of blood going in here? There's going to be a lot more going in here. What's that going to do to our glomerular capillaries? That's going to increase pressure. If that goes on long enough, what's going to happen? Mm. Our, what are we going to see in our urine? Proteins, blood. Okay. So we want to make sure that's intact. So what our kidneys do is say, hey, that's too high of a pressure. We're going to constrict the afferent arterial. And if we constrict that afferent arterial, what happens to the amount of blood going in? It decreases. And what happens to our GFR? It decreases back to normal. OK. But wait a minute. If we constrict this and we have less blood flowing in, but we didn't do anything over here, then we got a lot more blood flow going out. What's that going to do to your? GFR, that's going to decrease it. So in order to maintain a constant GFR at 125 milliliters per minute, what do we have to do to the efferent arterial? We have to contract that too. So what autoregulation does is it says, hey, we've got too much pressure coming in. Let's constrict, let more blood, let less blood in and less blood out so we maintain that 125 milliliters per minute. GFR. Does that make sense? All right. But what I usually like to do with students, especially undergrads, because they're so cute, they don't understand it. We have GFR. Let's assume it's 125. Regardless of anything else that's happening, if I constrict my efferent arterial, what does that do to GFR? That will increase GFR because I have more coming in, less going out, so it's got to go somewhere. It's going to go here. Okay. What happens if I dilate? my afferent arterial. That's going to increase GFR as well because I have a lot more blood going in, still relatively little coming out. It's going to increase my GFR. What happens if I dilate my efferent arterial? That's going to result in a decrease in GFR. Why? Same amount of blood going in, more blood going out, right? So if more blood's going out, pressure is going to drop here. GFR goes down. Okay, and then we already did the example. If I constrict my afferent arterial, GFR goes down because less blood's going in. All right, if you understand that, it'll serve you well. Does that make sense, though, in, in a general sense? Yes. So your kidneys are going to be able to regulate things to get th 
to get back to that 125. So it's going to do this thought experiment. You constrict that to let less blood in. Like, okay, we have less blood in, but our GFR is dropping too much. Like, it's, let's say it's down to like 80. And so our efferent arterial is saying, hey, pressure's going down here, right? Let's clamp down. And then GFR, let's say it goes to 150. Like, well, crap. Then do we have to clamp down on that more or clamp down on this more? And it'll be a back and forth until it's adjusted to normal. Hey. Good. Uh, so the question was, fight or flight, massive vasoconstriction throughout your body. It is the sympathetic nervous system that controls these, okay, because of uh, the response to stretch, okay? But it can be overridden locally to maintain proper GFR. So yes, uh, it will adjust to where you are, um, have a relatively constant GFR. But we also know that during fight or flight, especially if it's going on for a longer period of time, like we're really not urinating that much. So there is a little bit of a negative effect on GFR overall because you've got a system-wide thing to overcome, okay? Good. If you guys want, this little link down here in the uh, PowerPoint is a like a little activity you guys can raise things and lower things and see what that does to GFR if you're still having problems understanding it. If you do it and you think it's lame, let me know so that I can remove it. <laughs> because I never know what's going to work for you guys. Mm. Lecture's over. I don't know what's going on. I was kidding. <laughs> All right. Sorry, technical glitches. All right, so. Basically, this is showing you the same thing that we just talked about in a previous slide. I'd rather draw this stuff out because I think that makes more sense. It's dynamic. Uh, this slide is just showing you the same stuff we just talked about. So I'll put it to you that if you want to try to further understand it, go back to this slide, and it'll be a good summary of what we talked about. All right. Uh, neurohormonal control of GFR, GFR, GFR and renal blood flow. So... Not only do we have the sympathetic nervous system, as I discussed, controlling GFR, but we also have some, uh, not hormonal, humoral. What's the difference between hormonal and humoral? Hormonal refers to hormones. Humoral refers to any factor that's in the blood. So, sorry for the misspeaking. So the way to read this, do what? Any factor in blood. Humoral just refers to blood. So when we talk about our humoral immune system, it's so is a hormone factors in the blood. Also Do what? Is a hormone also? A hormone is also humoral. But there is a distinct difference. You can be hormonal humoral, or you can be just humoral. Yeah. <laughs> <sighs> Let's not talk about that anymore. Sorry. <laughs> All right. So um, the way to read this table, and I'm not going to go through the whole thing. Um, you have vasoconstrictors, you have vasodilators, so think about what those might do to your GFR. Um, so there's a stimulus for these vasoconstrictors or vasodilators to go into effect. There's the effect on GFR, G, GFR and the effect on RBF. What's RBF? Renal blood flow. Good. Okay. So. 
A few examples, vasoconstrictors, sympathetic nerves. We already talked about this. What's the stimulation for that? Decrease in ECFV. What does that mean? Good, extracellular fluid volume. So we have a decrease in pressure, okay, such as hemorrhage. So the, what I have in red are examples of what these would be. What's that going to, what effect is that going to have on GFR? It's going to decrease. What's that going to affect on renal blood flow? It's going to be a decrease in renal blood flow. The reason I put this table on he, in here is to give you a flavor for some of the factors involved in regulating GFR that satisfies one of your instructional learning objectives. Everything come out all right? <laughs> so I had to. I'm just... All right. Um, so if you have a decrease in extracellular fluid volume, of course, you want to uh, help raise your blood pressure. So these are going to uh, be enacted to do that. Okay. One thing I want to mention down at the bottom here are these natriuretic peptides. You have ANP, which is also called BNP. Sometimes you see AMP, atrial natriuretic peptide, but an older name is brain natriuretic peptide because that's where it was first isolated from. Um, both of those do the same thing. What happens is you have an increased stretch on the heart. What does that mean? If you have stretches, if your heart's stretching out, you have an increased blood flow coming back to the heart, which is an increased preload. All right, what's that going to do? That's going to say, hey, we've got a lot more volume in our body. We've got to do something about that. So that's going to enact some changes in the kidneys, okay? So A and P, B and P, uh, you will see uh, those interchange a lot. All right, a little bit about renal blood flow. 22% of our cardiac output is dedicated to renal blood flow. So that's almost 25%. That's a lot. Okay. We need a high blood flow because we need a high GFR. We need a filtration. What happens to people who can't GFR? Where do they go? Dialysis clinic. Um, okay. Really important. Because of this high blood flow, then all the oxygen and nutrients that are delivered to the kidneys are more than their metabolic needs, okay? Why is that important? Because we're filtering the blood. We, we don't have that blood flow for the purpose of giving the kidneys a lot of energy. We're to have that blood flow so that we can get an adequate GFR, filter the blood, form urine, get rid of waste, excess stuff in our body, okay? However, the oxygen that is used in the kidneys is greater than what we see in skeletal muscle. The oxygen use in kidneys is greater than what we see in skeletal muscle, at least resting skeletal muscle. But less than the resting heart. So that tells you that the kidneys use a lot of oxygen, but what they use it for is sodium reabsorption. Okay. Why is sodium reabsorption important? Why do you think it is? To retain water. To retain water. All right. We don't want to retain sodium because it's particularly good for us. I mean, we need sodium in our body, right? We don't have action potentials and we're just blobs on the floor. But we need to reabsorb that water, and water is always going to follow sodium. Okay. This, I'm not really going to go over in detail. We've done this, right? Does this look familiar? Where have we done this? Did we do this? Maybe we didn't do this. Damn. I suck. All right. Let's say, <laughs> let's say we have decreased oxygen delivery to the kidneys. The kidneys have sensors for oxygen. They say, oh, we don't have enough oxygen. What they're going to do is they're going to release a hormone called erythropoietin. All right, I should have covered this in the, in the blood lecture, but thinking about it, I didn't, and based on your reactions, I didn't. Uh, erythropoietin. Erythropoietin gets released, goes into the blood. Where's it going to go? Red bone marrow. 
in the bone marrow, what is sitting there waiting to be stimulated? To what? No. That's the end product. Hematopoietic stem cells. Okay, in the in bone marrow, you have those hematopoietic stem cells. So when erythropoietin comes, those hematopoietic stem cells become activated. They go down the red blood cell differentiating pathway, and we increase red blood cell volume. I do go over this a little bit. Okay. Did you say it was a long time ago? No, I said it in here. Oh. <laughs> it's like just last week. I don't even know what day it is today. Um, do what? This process? Yes. I remember yes. So that's what triggered my mind. I was like, no, I said it took a good couple days. Um, so you increase red blood cells. If we increase red blood cells, by proxy, we're increasing what? Oxygen. Oxygen. All right. And so that's going to, uh, go, this cycle is going to go into effect until oxygen levels reach where they need to be. That's going to shut off the production of erythropoietin. Again, a classic negative feedback pathway. All right. Another important part of this glomerulus uh, is the juxta glomerular apparatus. Juxta means next to. So literally, it's just a group of cells next to the glomerulus. And you're going to find it between the afferent arterial, the efferent arterial, and uh, nephron loop. So this area of cells right here. Made up of two structures. The macula densa, and that's going to be part of the tubule here. They're specialized cells. Um, that, and there's some controversy on this, that serve as like a salt sensor. Okay, so they detect changes in sodium in particular. Right? Then we have the juxtaglomerular cells right here that are signaled by the macula densa, and they control the secretion of renin. Right? If you type in Google what renin is, it'll autocorrect to renin. Renin is a gut hormone in cows. Renin is the hormone you want to be concerned with. Okay? So what happens is if it detects low sodium here, renin is going to release, be released and activate the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. Okay. And what's that geared towards? If you have low sodium, then it's going to raise sodium. We'll talk about that process later on. All right, second process, tubular reabsorption. So going from the tubes to the blood. All right. Uh, and it occurs at all different parts of the tubules, so we're going to go through those um, in detail. Here, we're looking at the proximal convoluted tubule. All right. And what do you notice is reabsorbed here? Sodium. What comes with it? Chloride. What else? Calcium, amino acids, glucose, phosphate, magnesium, and you have all of these solutes going into the blood. What's going to come along after it? Water, like, <laughs> I guess it'll come along. Okay. What do you notice that all of these transporters are coupled to? What are you getting rid of? Hydrogen. hydrogen. So most of these are coupled to the getting rid of hydrogen. Why do we want to get rid of hydrogen? To maintain pH, to maintain pH in our body. Good. Uh, that's going to be a really important discussion when we do acid base. Okay, so this is all occurring in the proximal convoluted tubule. Um, 
So proximal convoluted tubule, we know what it's capable of absorbing. Water comes by osmosis. Um, but a lot of substances, such as glucose, uh, are dictated by what we call the renal plasma threshold. And what that means is there's a threshold. I hate whiteboards sometimes. All right, let's call this a PCT. It's not convoluted whatsoever, but pretend it is. All right, let's say we have four glucose molecules going down this tubule. And we have four transporters for glucose. Effectively, can I reabsorb all that glucose? Yes. What if I add a lot more glucose? I'm not going to be able to transfer as much glucose in, so where am I going to start seeing glucose then? In the urine. In the urine. So the renal plasma threshold is the number of transporters that can carry a particular substance, which if you go above what those can handle, this stuff appears in the urine, all right? So the threshold is dictated by the transporters. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay, sodium and water reabsorption. Uh, we actually talked about all this already. Sodium goes in, chloride follows electrostatically because what sodium's charge? Positive. Chloride is negative. negative. So that's why sodium or chloride follows sodium. Then of course you have a um, question. Going out of this tubule, do you go directly into the blood? No, where do you go? Begins with an I, rhymes with pinimitional. Interstitial, good. Um, and then it eventually goes into the blood. All right, so it's not a direct process, even though most, even though for argument's sake, we uh, put it that way. All right, now tubular secretion. And let me see something real quick. We'll do tubular secretion and we'll take a break. How's that sound? Good. All right, tubular secretion, notice it is the active transport of certain substances. What does that mean? It requires ATP, energy, okay? So we're actively getting rid of things because we're like, get out of here. Okay, why do we want to get rid of things? Maybe the concentration is more than what we want, so we get rid of extra. Um, some things aren't supposed to be in there, like organic acids, organic bases, hydrogen ions, so we're like, hey, you can't be here, get out. Um, potassium, really, really important to maintain in balance, so we secrete it uh, actively when needed, but it can go out passively as well. So again, going from the blood to the tubules, we're trying to get rid of it actively. All right? What this is showing you is a paratubular capillary, this would be the distal convoluted tubule in the collecting ducts. And uh, what I'm trying to show you here is that usually getting rid of potassium or hydrogen is coupled to the reabsorption of sodium. Okay, and if we're specifically talking about the distal convoluted in the collecting ducts, it's aldosterone that's controlling that process. All right, so what does aldosterone do? It puts sodium potassium pumps on these renal tubular cells. Okay, what do sodium potassium pumps do? They pump sodium out and potassium in. Okay, and that's kind of shown down here, uh, right here. Sodium out, potassium in. On the other side, we have potassium channels going out, sodium going in. So if we have a constant uh, flow of potassium ions into the cell, what's going to happen to the concentration of potassium inside that cell? It's going to go up. 
concentration of potassium out here is relatively low. So where's potassium going to want to go? Out, right? And the opposite is happening for sodium. So by putting more sodium potassium pumps here, we're effectively increasing uh, gradients so that we can have potassium go one way and sodium go the other. Does that make sense? All right, let's take a break. All right, renin angiotensin, which I know is everybody's favorite subject on earth, right? Because everybody loves hormones. Thank you. All right, renin angiotensin. <clears throat> we alluded to this. It's really simple. It regulates sodium excretion. Okay? And actually, I probably, I think I said it wrong before. All right. Yes, I did say it wrong before. The secretion of renin. First of all, what's it secreted by? Juxtaglomerular cells. Okay? What stimulates the secretion of renin? Decreased blood pressure. Sympathetic nervous system, low sodium, and decreased renal blood flow. Okay, all of these tell you that you don't have enough volume, or at least that's what the kidneys interpret it as. So, I said it was a way to reab. Yeah, did I, did I say it was a way to reabsorb sodium, or did it say it was a way to get rid of sodium? I thought I misspoke. Okay, so it's geared towards reabsorbing. Okay, so these are the stimuli for secretion. What happens is um, your liver's only somewhat involved, all right? It produces a protein called angiotensinogen, and that's always circulating in your blood. So it's not something that gets released specifically in the system. It's always in your blood. When the kidneys detect any of these things, they release renin into the blood. Renin converts angiotensinogen into ang1. Okay? When angiotensin 1 goes to the lungs where you have angiotensin converting enzyme or ACE, it converts angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. All right? And even though this is called the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, I'm going to and the goal is to increase sodium reabsorption and therefore we're also increasing what water and therefore we're also increasing what volume therefore we're also increasing what pressure. pressure blood pressure good okay I put it to you that this is the end goal but it's ang2 that's the most important molecule in this pathway why? Because angiotensin 2, it can cause aldosterone secretion, which will cause the reabsorption of sodium, but it also vasoconstricts. And when you vasoconstrict, what happens to blood pressure? Goes up. Also increases ADH secretion. First of all, what's ADH? Antidiuretic hormone. And what does antidiuretic hormone cause you to do? Retain water. Good. Okay, and it also increases thirst. So all of these mechanisms get more water into your body, raise your blood pressure. Okay, aldosterone is just one of the pathways. So that's why I consider angiotensin II to be the most important molecule in this pathway, even though it's the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. Okay. <clears throat> now we're going to talk about more specifically how urine is formed and a little more specifics about the secretion and reabsorption of things. So we're going to use sodium and water as our primary electrolytes and fluid. 
in the proximal convoluted tubule, it is permeable to water. So what does that mean? Let's say this is a proximal convoluted tubule. Water can go this way or this way, right? It's permeable to water and will transport sodium. Okay, so that means it always, does it always transport sodium? No, but it can, okay? By the time you get to the end of the proximal convoluted tubule, before you go into the loop, what you have is an isotonic fluid. What that means is the concentration of fluids in the tube is about equal to the concentration of fluids in your blood. Isotonic. Remember that term, isotonic, hypertonic, hypotonic? All right, when we get down to the nephron loop, it's permeable to water, but not permeable to sodium. Okay? Here in the medulla of the kidney, which is where these nephron loops are, we have an increasing sodium concentration. So it's relatively low up towards the cortex and really high down here further into the medulla. So if we have fluid in a tube and the tube is permeable to water, where's water going to want to go? Toward the high solute concentration. So it's going to leave the tube. Okay? Because it's only permeable to water. Everything else is left behind. By the time you reach the tip of the nephron loop, you have a hypertonic fluid. Why? Hmm? Concentration is higher. Why? Why is there more sodium? All the water left. Good. Right? Then fluid starts moving up. The distal convoluted tubule, or I'm sorry, not distal, ascending limb, it's permeable to sodium and chloride. I can transport. So it's going to start pushing things out, but impermeable to water. So in the ascending limb, you're actively pushing sodium out, chloride's following passively, all right? So you put a lot of solutes out here, and I'll put it to you that this is how you increase that concentration out here. So that by the time you reach the end of the ascending limb, now you have a hypotonic fluid. So lower concentration than that of water. Blood, hypotonic fluid up here at the top because of changes in permeability that happen along this nephron loop. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, so now we have like a really dilute fluid sitting in what's gonna be the distal convoluted tubule. So the distal convoluted tubule, it is permeable to sodium, but will also actively transport sodium with the help of aldosterone, all right? So sodium can move but it will move a lot more if aldosterone is present. Why? Because we're putting sodium potassium pumps in the membranes, okay? That's gonna be important. So if presence of aldosterone, we're gonna be reabsorbing a lot of sodium, okay? Sodium's gonna to continue to go out into the uh, interstitial space. Then in the then in the distal convoluted tubule, as well as the collecting duct, because remember we have this, and then they all converge on these collecting ducts. It's impermeable to water. So if we just leave things alone, what kind of fluid are we getting rid of? If we just leave things alone, so we say the distal convoluted tubule, permeable sodium, we don't have aldosterone present, and we go to the collecting duct, what kind of fluid are we gonna pee out? Hypotonic. hypotonic, it's gonna be hypotonic. Go back to that, don't literally go back to that, go back to that slide where we saw we have 180 liters of fluid, and we only produce a, a liter of urine a day. If processes in this area in this area didn't occur, then we get rid of all that fluid. So it's here that that water reabsorption is really, really important and where it mostly occurs. So in the distal convoluted tubule and collecting duct, if ADH is present, 
then you'll transport water. So what it does, ADH puts what we call aquaporins, big water channels, into the distal convoluted tubule and collecting duct. Okay, and why does water pour out of the tube? Because it's because it's hypotonic and because what about the stuff outside of the tubule? And no such space is hypertonic, right? So water's gonna flow out. Okay. One mistake I always see students make is with aldosterone. What does aldosterone do? If you had to just put a couple words, what does aldosterone do? Two words. Sodium reabsorption. Does that have anything to do with water? Absolutely not. Antidiuretic hormone, strictly water reabsorption. Okay. However, both of these have to work together in order to get water in. You have to let the sodium out and then the water is going to follow if you give it a channel to follow it. Okay. So both of those are really important for the process of reabsorbing water. Okay, now, this is really hard to demonstrate on a whiteboard, so I'm going to play this in class because I think it's that important. You have something in your kidney called the countercurrent mechanism. And what that does is it increases the concentration of fluid in your medullary space and creates a gradient. So remember I said the gradient is low at the, near the cortex, high deep down in the medulla. This is how that's created and what allows you to pull water out. I gotta turn it back on, don't I? Seriously? Thank you. Kidneys. The loop of Henley is found between the proximal convoluted tubule and the distal convoluted tubule in the nephra. There are actually two types of nephra in the kidney, cortical and juxta medullary. This happens to be a juxta medullary nephra because of its long loop of Henley and the fact that it dips down into the medulla of the kidney. This type is well suited to the role of helping Concentrate urine. As discussed in my function of the nephron video, filtrate moves through the tubules and eventually exits the collecting duct as urine. But what we want to know is why does the concentration of filtrate increase as you go further down the loop of Henry? Osmolarity is the concentration of a solution, often expressed as nearly osmols per litre. Filtrate in the proximal convoluted tubule has an osmolarity of 300 milliosmoles per litre, the same as the surrounding interstitial fluid. This means that the filtrate is isoosmotic with its surroundings. But it's a very different story in the loop of Henley. Let's zoom in. Let me give you a brief recap of what happens here, but if you want more details, including information about permeability, do go back and watch my previous video. Okay, so in the that video doesn't system, work. Sodium ions are pumped out, and negative ions such as chloride follow, making the medulla a quite concentrated and salty region. Water leaves passively from the thin descending limb because of the surrounding salty environment, and as the water leaves, the filtrate in the descending limb becomes significantly more concentrated. In addition, the salty medulla is also a major reason why water is able to move passively out of the collecting duct and be reabsorbed back into the gut, thus leaving behind more concentrated urine. But let's pretend that the filtrate is entering the loop of Henley for the very first time. Naturally, because the filtrate is coming from the proximal convoluted tubule, it will have the same 300 milliosmoles per litre osmolarity and be isoosmotic with the interstitial fluid. However, this situation is not ideal for creating concentrated urine. So in the latter part of the loop of Henley, our aim is to create a difference of 200 milliosmoles per litre between the ascending limb and the interstitial fluid. The only way to do this is by pumping out sodium ions. So let's pump. As 
you can see the osmolarity in the interstitial fluid has decreased due to a loss of sodium, whereas in the interstitial fluid it has increased due to a gain of sodium. And if you look closely at the values, you'll see that we have achieved the 200 milliosmol per liter difference, otherwise known as a gradient. But what's happening with the descending layer? Here the filtrate needs to equilibrate, meaning that the water will leave passively until the filtrate in the descending layer reaches the same osmolarity as the interstitial fluid. Time to equilibrate. Note, equilibrating does not change the osmolarity of the interstitial fluid. Filtrate moves through the neck bar continuously, but I'm going to break this down into steps for you. Why? Why doesn't the interstitial fluid change? Guesses? Lar, go ahead. No. Large area. You have a lot of medullary space, but these tubes are really small. So small changes in a small tube, small changes in a small tubule are going to be big. Small changes in a big wide football field, very small. So that's why that doesn't change when you pump the water out. The fluid in a liter penny. When brand new 300 milliosmol per litre filtrate enters the descending layer from the proximal convoluted tubule, the filtrate already in the liter penny is pushed further along. Bringing back our values for the interstitial fluid, we see that our gradient has been messed up, so we need to re establish that ideal 200 milliosmol per litre difference. Let's pump out some sodium ions. Okay, although the values vary, there is still a difference of 200 at all levels, so we're content. Now to equilibrate the descending layer with the interstitial fluid and advance the fluid in the loop of penny a little. Lo and behold, the gradient is messed up again, but we know what to do. Let's pump and establish that 200 milliosmol per litre gradient, equilibrate to match the osmolarity and advance the fluid. Okay, one more time to get the point across. Our gradient is messed up, pump out sodium to restore the gradient, and equilibrate. All right, so looking at our values for the interstitial fluid, we can see that the osmolarity increases the deeper you go into the medulla. As all that pumping and equilibrating continues, we eventually reach a maximum concentration of around 1,200 milliosmos per litre. The entire process that I have just described is called countercurrent multiplication, Countercurrent because the filtrate flows in opposite directions in the limbs of the lupa penny, and multiplication because this countercurrent flow enables the effects of the gradient to be increased, i.e., multiplied. So, in summary, the loops of penny of juxta medullary network are involved in the process of countercurrent multiplication, which enables the interstitial fluid to become more concentrated, i.e., increase in osmolarity into the medulla. The high concentrations in the medulla facilitate the passive movement of water out of the collecting duct and result in more concentrated urine. Okay, hopefully this tutorial was helpful to you. Result in more concentrated... Ah, damn it. Water going out, right? What's the condition for that? Hmm? No. What's the condition for water leaving the tube? You have the gradient. You have the gradient. We already know that. What else is absolutely necessary? ADH. You have to have ADH in order for this water to leave. If you don't have ADH, water stays in the tube. Okay? And you produce a dilute urine. So this counter corner counter current multiplier in reality is what allows us to produce a very concentrated urine and keep the water inside of us. Okay? And I like her accent. It's better than my white trash accent. Okay, <clears throat> so urine concentration. Two things that are important, medullary osmotic gradient, we just talked about how that's formed and that it draws water out, but it only draws water out if 
antidiuretic hormone is present. If you don't have antidiuretic hormone, you don't do that. Really good example of this. Anybody know a potent inhibitor of antidiuretic hormone? Alcohol. Alcohol. All right. So when you're drinking alcohol, one of the reasons why you're constantly going pee is that you are inhibiting antidiuretic hormone, so you're going to diurese a lot. Then when you wake up the next morning with that fucking headache and you go to the bathroom and it looks like brown, it's because ADH said, <laughs> I was drunk, sorry, I'll do my job now, and it'll start reabsorbing that water. Okay, and this is just what that looks like, okay? So without ADH, dilute fluid, with ADH, and the medullary osmotic gradient, you have a more concentrated fluid. All right, how do we get rid of urine? We've already talked about the fact that all of these collecting ducts kind of come down here to this renal papilla right here. Fill in the minor calluses, fill in the major calluses, and then to the renal pelvis, and then out the ureter. Okay, so all of it collects. The ureters then are these tubes that go from the kidneys down to the uh, urinary bladder in the male and the female, but the female doesn't have ureters apparently. Okay? They are thin, they have mucus in them, they're muscular and fibrous layers. Okay, so three layers just like most of the things, most of the tubes in our body and they're subject to peristaltic waves that force urine into the bladder. Urine can flow through them, but peristaltic waves help push it down. Probably very similarly to how we talked about with the male reproductive system and sperm movement. All right, in the urinary bladder, we have uh, a muscular sac all right, it's just it's just it can stretch. <laughs> okay, as it fills up, and as it stretches, that's going to send signals to where brain, and the brain's going to interpret that as I got to pee. Okay, uh, the muscle that's surrounding it's called the detrusor muscle. Now, one really neat thing about this is, bless you, damn it, this ureter comes down and it comes down in the back here, but part of the ureter is within the wall of the uh, urinary bladder. The interesting thing about this is because you have ureter here in the wall, when the bladder starts filling up, it compresses on the ureter and that acts as a one-way valve to prevent backflow of urine up, back up the ureter, right? It prevents urinary reflux, what we call it. Why is that important? If you have urinary reflux, you get you're more prone to what? UTIs. UTIs, good. Ascending UTIs, which are really bad. Pyelonephritis. All right, <clears throat> so these two holes right here in the floor of the urinary bladder those are the ureter openings. Then you have a third opening making a triangle, which we refer to as the trigon. Okay, and then urine will flow out the ureter and outside the body. Of course, we know the ureter for a female is much shorter than that of the male, and the opening of the ureter is much closer to the uh, anal orifice than a male's is, therefore females automatically, I'm sorry, are more prone to UTIs as well for that reason. I didn't make it that way. I do it different. All right, when we get rid of urine, that's called the scientific term micturition, okay? Driven by the parasympathetic nervous system. Okay, so, uh, parasympathetic goes to the detrusor muscle that will cause squeezing and will push down it will also open the internal sphincter 
for the ureter. All right, so just like the anus, you have an internal and external sphincter uh, surrounding the ureter. So the internal urethral sphincter under parasympathetic control. We can't control that. Urine's going to start coming out. This, the external uh, urethral sphincter, we do have voluntary control over. So when we have to go to the bathroom and we're holding it, that's what we're uh, controlling is that external sphincter. Okay. So what this is just showing you is that you have uh, sensory neurons going this way and then motor neurons going this way to uh, squeeze the bladder, internal urethral uh, sphincter, and then somatic nerves to the external urethral sphincter. All right, so in effect, it is kind of a reflex, but we do have control over it. Okay. I think this is the last slide, right? Yes, okay. This is a diagram basically showing you volume of urine in the bladder and the pressure in that bladder. Okay, notice that as you increase volume, pressure increases to a certain point. Once you get to about 200 milliliters, that's when the signals start getting sent to say, I've got to go. So at about, 100, about 150 to 200 milliliters, that's when you start getting the first signals to say, I got to go to the bathroom. As the bladder fills up, what happens to these signals? They increase. So that means that the uh, um, intensity at which you're feeling you have to go to the bathroom increases with the volume. Okay, that makes sense, right? And you're also, because you're increasing volume, you're increasing pressure, stretch. And that's going to send more action potentials and make you uh, have to go to the bathroom. We can control that to a point, uh, but usually that will start failing in about 300 to 400 milliliters. Unless you had a dad that every time you went somewhere said, we're not fucking stopping at the next rest stop, so you better fucking hold it. <laughs> I'm not speaking from experience at all. <laughs> Um, so it can fail, and that's where we get incontinence, All right? So that ends the urinary system. No, we're not. Dang. No. We're gonna get, we're gonna get up to acid base. It's not 61. There's 61 slides in it, but that's not where acid base ends, starts. Um, when you have increased urgency, but the water is not full, it's not at 150 milliliters, what is going on there? There could be some irritation to the urinary bladder. Um, it could be a uh, overactive nerve that is causing that. Yep. So your first reflex is not affected when you're just your second reflex? Yes. Yep. All right. So this is related to what we've just been talking about. It's electrolyte balance and fluid balance. I promise you, I don't go into a whole lot of detail about electrolyte balance. You're welcome. But fluid balance is going to be really important. There's a couple exercise. I edited my PowerPoint and I forgot to do something which is completely blows what I'm, anyway. Maybe, no. If we would be done today, then that means you're gonna have a lot of videos to watch. Onward and upward. All right, I'll be quick. Balance concept. Well, I'll be quick up till 2 o'clock. I mean, it's already 2 o'clock. 3 o'clock. Shut up. <laughs> balance. Everything in our body is balanced. If we have fluid loss, we have to make that up in fluid intake. If we have fluid intake, we have to make that up in fluid loss. Same with electrolytes. 
okay? We need to maintain a balance. Um, for fluid intake, that is regulated by our thirst mechanism and our habits. Like, when you're thirsty, that's not a reason to go out and drink beer, right? That would be a habit. Uh, electrolyte intake is governed by dietary habits. So we obtain all our electrolytes by what we eat, all right? So output of fluid regulated by kidneys and electrolyte output also regulated by kidneys. So directly related to what we were just talking about, still the kidneys. All right, you've seen this before, which is good because that means I don't have to cover as much detail. The important part about this is anything you take into your body goes into the plasma. Because the plasma is connected to the interstitial fluid, whatever happens to the plasma is translated there. Whatever happens to the interstitial fluid is translated to the inside of the cell. Okay? The only thing I've added here is that all of this is extracellular fluid. All of this is intracellular fluid. So I'm going to use uh, ICF and ECF to uh, denote that. Okay, so here's the other thing. We talked about balance. If I lose water from plasma and my volume becomes lower, my plasma doesn't like that. I'm not taking any more in, so where does the water have to come from to make up that plasma volume? Interstitial. Interstitial fluid doesn't like being dehydrated, so it's going to draw from the cell. Cells don't like being dehydrated, but do they have anywhere to draw from? No, so when cells in our nervous system detect that, what do they do? Tell you to reabsorb water, tell you to get thirsty, tell you to go drink something, okay? So uh, that's an important concept to keep in mind, uh, especially when we start doing fluid calculations. We've seen this before too. We're not doing real calculations, it's interpretations of graphs. I just wanna piss you guys off. <laughs> It worked? Are you guys pissed? Sweet. Come at me. Let's do it. I'm looking for a fight. All right. We have extracellular fluid and intracellular fluid. We talked about this last week, uh, right? I know I showed this graph. You guys told me that when we have a cell, on the outside we have high concentration of sodium chloride and calcium, also bicarbonate. On the inside we have potassium, Magnesium. If we have a concentration of high concentration of potassium on the inside of a cell, what does that mean about potassium concentration outside of the cell? It's low. So because we have high concentrations of stuff outside and different concentrations concentrations of different stuff inside, what does that create across each cell membrane? Gradients. gradients. And are gradients important? Yes. Why? To do work. To do work. Equilibrium is death. All right, gradients, let us do work. All right, for a 70 kilogram adult, which is about how many pounds? 70 times 2.2 is about a 150. Good. Specifically 153. Um, <laughs> I can't give Cody crap. He's been trying all day, so. <laughs> which is, no, which is more than I can say for a lot of people. <laughs> Boom! Um, all right, intake of fluid. All this is trying to show you is that uh, fluid that we take in, fluid from metabolism, so what's produced by mitochondria, um, ends up being about 2,300, so we gotta get rid of 2,300 milliliters of fluid. Some comes from the skin. Now, from the skin, it's just evaporation. That's not sweating. It's not what I'm doing right now. Uh, I'm fucking hot. Um, <clears throat> uh, that's just evaporation off the skin. Also, every time we talk or breathe, we lose water too, okay? Uh, then from the sweat, feces, and urine, that equals up to 2,300. If we have heavy exercise, all those values go up, okay? So whatever we take in, so whatever we lose in excess, we have to take in in excess too. And that's uh, important to note that we have to be aware of where we're losing fluid and where we can gain it back. 
Okay. Uh, pew, pew. Be familiar with this kind of graph because that's what we're going to go over and there will be a question on your exam related to this. Right. You have intracellular fluid and extracellular fluid. Uh, why are the boxes different size? Because our fluid inside our cells is much greater volume than what we have outside of our cells, despite, uh, you know, if we bleed out, that looks like a lot. But if our cells throw up, it's going to be even more. Right? Water moves across cell membranes pretty easily. We don't need much for that to happen. Uh, but the concentration of the ICF should be equal to that of the ECF. That's what this is trying to show right here. The concentration on both sides should be equal. And if we were to put that in terms of a concentration of sodium chloride, what would that be? Zero point nine percent, right? Saline, normal saline. Okay. What? I never heard of that. Um, so that's the number we're going to use. Okay, you guys told me that you understand this, right? If I have a red blood cell that's at 0.9% and I put it in uh, an isotonic fluid which has 0.9%, what's going to happen to that red blood cell? Nothing. It's going to stay the same. But if I put this 0.9% into a 3% salt solution, what's going to happen to that red blood cell? It's going to shrink. Why? Water left the cell. Opposite, if I put it into straight up water, and water has what percentage of sodium chloride? Zero. So that's less than 0.9%. Put the cell in there, cell's going to swell because water's going to go towards higher solute concentration. All right? Should be a familiar concept. How do we apply that to? the body, okay? What I was supposed to have done is take out all of the things with red boxes in your PowerPoint so that you didn't say, oh, I already know what happens. So you had to guess at the answer. That was my fault. Um, I did have a beer last night. <laughs> That's not why I actually got distracted by something else. You guys will see what I'm talking about. All right, so this is what I want you guys to answer. If this is my body, this is a normal state, right? And I add two liters of 3% sodium chloride. We just did the cell experiment with the cells. First of all, where's that going to be added to? First. Extracellular. So we're going to add that right here. We're going to add 2 liters of 3% NaCl. What is our normal volume of blood? 5 liters. 5 liters. So if I'm adding 2 liters, that's almost half my volume of blood, right? So that's a, a, a lot. Okay. And we're adding 3%. What concentration is that relative to our body fluid? Hypertonic. hypertonic. Good. So we're adding a shitload of hypertonic fluid to our blood. Which one of these boxes represents what happens to the fluid in our body as a result? How did you guess? Because uh, the extracellular fluid will be over the intracellular fluid. You're wrong. So, you guys have these X's on there, which is why I was supposed to remove them, okay? So, the answer is E. Why E? You put a lot of extracellular, hypertonic, extracellular, hypertonic fluid in that compartment. What's that going to do? You're adding a lot of volume, so you're going to shift the volume that way, right? It's going to expand the amount that's in the extracellular fluid. 
What's going to happen to concentration of that fluid, though? It's going to increase, so that's why you see the box go up there. Okay, But the extracellular fluid space is not going to increase just because of the two liters you're adding. What's going to happen to intracellular fluid? That's going to go that way as well. It's going to go towards a higher solute concentration. So our intracellular fluid volume is actually going to drop. And because of that, concentration there is going to be higher as well. Does that make sense? You lose water, but you don't use, lose the sodium. Because going this way represents volume changes. <laughs> going this way represents concentration changes. Oh, so cool. Okay. <laughs> so osmolarity versus volume. Okay, does that make sense? Okay. So, then, you were, then I was supposed to do that and then show you this. What are the changes following variables after giving this? IV, extracellular fluid volume, does what? Increases. Increases. Extracellular fluid osmolarity? In <laughs> oh my god. I'm pissed. All right. Increases. You are correct. Intracellular fluid volume decreases because at 3% in the uh, plasma is pulling uh, fluid out of cells and intracellular fluid osmolarity increases because it's losing that water. Okay, so all that's left behind is solutes. So mad at myself. All right, effect of adding two liters of water. So I take water, which has 0%, and I add it here. Which one of these boxes represents what happens? B is in bollocks. B is in bollocks. <laughs> Got that right this time. <laughs> he did. All right, so I added water. All right, that two liters is going to increase the extracellular fluid volume. You guys, yes? Okay. But because we have 0.9% here and we added less than 0.9%, that volume is going to shift. Most of that volume is going to shift intracellularly. So that's why we have this box extended out past the normal intracellular volume. Now, because we added water, the concentration of both compartments is going to decrease. So we have a shift towards intracellular fluid volume at a lower concentration. Does that make sense why? Yeah. Yes. If you don't get this, this might be something you might want to just create these boxes yourself and do over. like. Do what I didn't do. Get rid of the X boxes and don't get rid of your X box. X box says, because X, X box is fun. Um, and try these experiments yourself, okay? Uh, why am I telling you about this? Why am I making a big deal about it? You guys are going to be healthcare providers. If you order an infusion of water, which you mostly won't do, <laughs> or a hypertonic saline solution, which you probably will do, you better know what's going to happen to that person's fluid, okay, and what the consequences of that are going to be. That's your job. Okay? Uh, I'm not going to go through that again. All right. Now, if I add two liters of 0.9% saline, which is typically what your... Uh, um, IVs are going to be. What's going to happen? Okay. Okay. Why? Okay. I added water there. That's the same concentration as the fluids in my body. So I'm not going to have any more exchange between those compartments than I normally do. So that's just going to shift our extracellular fluid volume. If your patient is truly, truly dehydrated, and needs more fluid in the cells, is it appropriate to give them 0.9% saline? Yes. 
No. no. What? Because it won't get to the intracellular fluid compartment. So giving 0.9% saline is not appropriate. What would be more appropriate? Less concentrated, right? We, we never give our patients water intravenously, but we can give them 0.45%. That's legit. If our patient's truly dehydrated intracellularly and has all the signs of that, like severely dehydrated, we want to give them a less concentration so that fluid shifts to the intracellular compartment. Because if you give 0.9% saline, we just showed that it won't shift into the intracellular fluid compartment. And is that helping your patient at all? No, not really. What are you, what are you gonna get so deep? There's a difference between true hydra true dehydration and just we'll put, okay. Best way to put this. Severe dehydration is cellular dehydration. Anything like mild or moderate is not cellular dehydration. So you want to increase their fluid compartment because their blood pressure is low. Uh, so that will bring that up. But if it's true cellular dehydration where you've pulled everything out, then you want to give something that's going to push everything back in. Whereas in mild and moderate, you haven't pulled a whole lot out yet. You've just dropped blood volume. Okay. okay. Oh, ooh, and this is a good one too. Effect of adding two liters of 5% glucose. What is 5% glucose in terms of concentration compared to your body? Guesses. No? It's actually hypertonic. All right, so you're putting a hypertonic solution into extracellular space. Okay, what's going to happen? Initially, you're going to increase volume. That's going to be instantaneous, okay? But over time, you're giving glucose. What happens to glucose when cells come in contact with it? They take it in, right? Why do they want glucose? Energy, right? So what happens is that glucose then becomes 4%, 3%, 2%, 0%. Now what kind of solution are you dealing with? Hypotonic. Actually, I misspoke. 5% glucose is closer to isotonic, which is why you see this at first. Okay. I know, I know. Okay, so does that make sense why that happens? You metabolize the glucose, it goes inside the cells, so now you added two liters of a hypotonic solution. So that fluid's gonna shift into the cells, and maybe you don't want it to do that. If a person's not dehydrated, could that be bad? Yes, so uh, word of caution about that. All right, we're going to skip past the dehydration one, but I would recommend you going over that on your own because the same concepts are going to apply. Okay, electrolyte regulation. Where are we in time? All right, this will only take four minutes. <laughs> electrolyte regulation. The most important ones you need to know about, at least for this class, although when you get to ClinMed, you'll have to know the rest of them as well. Sodium, potassium, and calcium. Why? Sodium for water, potassium for cardiac events, uh, and uh, action potentials like nervous system function, and calcium for muscle and heart, okay? We know what regulates sodium. What regulates sodium? Aldosterone, 
We know how it does that. I'm not going to go over it again. We also know that that regulates potassium, right? Reabsorb potassium, do what to, or reabsorb sodium, do what to potassium? Get rid of it. Remember? <laughs> I, all right, I get it. You guys are toast. Going opposite directions. So that's why it does that. For calcium, it's regulation by parathyroid hormone and calcitonin. All right, easy way to remember this. Parathyroid hormone increases blood calcium. Parathyroid hormone increases blood calcium. Where does that come from? It activates osteoclasts to break down bone, increases calcium. It tells the kidneys to conserve calcium, so you reabsorb it. And it tells the intestines to absorb more calcium. So that increases your blood calcium overall. So then what would calcitonin do? Decrease blood calcium by reversing these processes. Okay, I had a student who is actually now an instructor here. That's kind of cool. Um, nursing instructor said the way he remembered it is calcitonin helps keep your bone in. It's a crude sexual reference, but it works because it puts bone back in and drawing it from the blood. All right, the only reason I put this here is we coupled potassium, getting rid of potassium, to the renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system. But if potassium concentration decreases, the adrenal cortex can be directly stimulated to release aldosterone as well. So potassium can directly affect aldosterone secretion. It doesn't have to go through the RAS system. All right, and chloride, guess what? The easiest one. If you reabsorb sodium, what else are you going to reabsorb? Chloride. chloride. There's no real hormone that directly uh, affects what happens to chloride. So it's uh, coupled to the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. Uh, and then phosphate, sulfate, reabsorbed by kidney, active transport. We showed that in the kidney lecture. Okay?